Hey internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. And on this week's show, a question about modern day prophecy, claims to the charismatic gifts, and cessationism. Roundabout. Cessation. Cessationism. Round a uh, bound. Cynicism cessation. Roundabout. Stopping stuff. Stick around. But first, it's time for your issues, etc. question of the week. So I have discovered Lutheranism. Excellent! However, my evolution into Lutheranism came after being involved in charismatic, non-denominational, and Baptist churches. Bogus. The result is that now I have some trust issues when it comes to finding a church. Yeah, I get it. In addition to that, the liturgical style is something completely foreign to me. Yeah, it's foreign to this world. Huh? It all just seems a little overwhelming. Any advice? You know, I've really avoided doing a series of videos on liturgy and Lutheran worship, at least as we've received it in our heritage, in large part because you just can't do it justice in a set of video series. We don't have enough time, we're moving too fast, and the style is a bit contrary to the actual idea, frankly. I mean, this isn't worship, yeah? However, if you ever were to like, you know, join the Lutheran Ninja Clan and help us get to the point where we're producing our own content, we could take the time to develop such videos. <laughs> But until then, as many times as we get this question, we're just going to keep pointing you back to the absolute high bar set by Pastor William Whedon in no less than 24 episodes of Issues Etc. An entire series on the historic liturgy, the why, the how, the where it came from, and the why you shouldn't just cast it aside. The way to sink your teeth into it, the way to approach it to somebody who's never seen it before, the way to learn from it, as one learning from your elders. Each episode takes a piece of the divine service and explains everything about why it's there, where it came from, and what what good it does you. It's significance in history. There's no question that after listening through all of this or even some of it, you're going to begin to appreciate what's going on in church a whole lot more. Click on the link below, scroll through randomly, throw a dart at one of the elements of the liturgy, and start listening. Yo! Uh -oh, oh, oh, uh -oh. Hey, Mal. Here we go. Pastor Fisk, I am now gaining in understanding that tongues that are spoken of in the Bible are human tongues. Ah, uh, yes. But in Corinthians, we see the mention of prophecy. Are we to be trying to make prophecies? Like the new churches claim to do today. I'm guessing there is more to know. Please explain. Thanks. All right, now we could do an entire thing just on 1 Corinthians 10 through 14, 15 and all, but I think we've done that in the past, if I'm not mistaken. But if we haven't, I think what we're going to do today is going to be just a little bit more helpful in like the big picture way of looking at stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Today we're going to talk about tongues, prophecy, and the charismatic gifts, and my position, my belief, that the Bible pretty much teaches that while these things certainly were miraculous events taking place in the first century for the sake of affirming the apostles as sent by God to, in fact, write inspired and inerrant scripture, as well as preach it, and while they could give these gifts to other people at that time, the people who got these gifts weren't able to give these gifts even more, and so when the apostles died, it stopped. But guess what didn't stop? The prophecy to which all these gifts pointed, which is in fact written down in scripture for you. Now, of course, we're coming at this from this point of view in the first place, being Lutheran Christians, we cling to this idea called sola scriptura. Here I stand. I can do no other. The idea that the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, the witnesses of the New Testament and Old Testament are the only sure rule and norm for understanding what God actually wants you to think and believe is true. And so no extra biblical ideas or ration or explanation or even proofs really is allowed to mitigate the meaning of what Scripture actually says. Now most Christians today that are American Christians like to say, yeah, I'm a Bible-believing Christian. The thing is, they're not. Oh, snap! They like to hold up their Bible and say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can. Blah, blah, blah. But they haven't read it very much or they wouldn't actually be saying that because you can't do what it says to do for sure. All right, so charismatic gifts. The word charisma comes out of the New Testament. It's just the Greek word for gift, a free gift. And so to say a charismatic gift is kind of weird. It's like repeating a redundancy or like driving in your car automobile or being a Pastor Fisk ninja. I'm not going to apologize for the ways that I defy physics. You know? Now, this word does get used sometimes to refer to charisma 
gifts from the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, the heart and soul and core of which is in fact prophecy. All of the other gifts are connected to and interrelated with prophecy and cannot be separated from it. But prophecy, as scripture itself defines it, is not necessarily a talking point about a future event that's going to take place, although it can contain that. Prophecy, biblically understood, is words revealed immediately, directly, by God to an individual human to speak to others. This can include things like divine revelation about the future, but also things like the ability to discern spirits. Then coming with this comes the ability to heal by command, and even speak in other tongues or have a hearer understand another tongue. <laughs> Even in the Old Testament, all of these miracles like healing were also connected to a man being a prophet who then could speak for God. And so similarly then, in the New Testament, the ability to speak in tongues became a sign of prophecy for the New Testament church. So everything that's going to be said about, say, speaking in tongues is connected to the other kinds of miraculous gifts given in Scripture because they all exist to affirm the prophecy of a prophet. Now there were periods of miraculous gifts and prophecy throughout the Old Testament, but none so much as the time of our Lord's actual incarnation, life, death, and resurrection. I mean, you see an outpouring like had never been seen before. Even one of such, it may have been prophesied, I will pour out my spirit in those days, which if you look carefully at the text of Acts chapter 2, Peter actually says is fulfilled right then at Pentecost. But the question is not whether or not the Bible relates to us what was happening then. I mean, hopefully we can all agree on that, although I know, sadly, that's not always true for Christians, but it should be if you're Bible believing. Yeah. The question is whether these prophetic and miraculous realities are also given to the church of today. Now, my thesis, my statement to you, is that such an idea is entirely contrary to the revealed word of God. <laughs> such an idea is entirely contrary to the revealed word of God. Meanwhile, the charismatic movement, although a relatively new phenomenon, but with uh, tentacles going back to the Middle Ages, would of course say the opposite and say that I am limiting the Holy Spirit in my perspective. But it kind of comes down to this. If the Holy Spirit says, hey, I'm the Holy Spirit and I'm limiting limiting myself in this way, are we limiting him by believing what he says? Or are we in fact disobeying and disbelieving him when we refuse to believe it and try to force his hand in the present when he said, eh, it's not coming guys, ain't gonna be there. <laughs> All right, so the first step is to recognize that unlearned tongues, like prophecy, both of these things together, when taught by the power of God, are then in fact words taught by God himself. In this way, any claim to be one speaking words taught by God himself must, of essence, be a claim to speaking words that demand from every hearer complete acceptance and obedience. They are ultimately and ineffably true. But we also know from scripture, say for example, Jeremiah 14, that not all claims to be words words taught by God are actually words taught by God. That is to say, false teachers and false prophets do exist, and scripture teaches this pretty clearly. And the scripture also says that any claims to utterances of words taught by God that are not actually taught by God don't demand our obedience from God, but the opposite. God demands our rejection of them. For this reason, we are constantly exhorted to test the spirits, right? To test all utterances claimed to be from God. Now, how can we know that the scripture fits such a thing? Well, first, the Lord himself appointed those he named named apostles for this purpose and promised them the Holy Spirit in extra portion for this purpose. Meanwhile, he also absorbed into his own teaching the prophets of the Old Testament, confirming their truth, and then wrapped it all up with a bow by giving the apostles these miraculous gifts of which we're talking about. And they demonstrated this in more ways than one. For example, and you can't miss it, you want to talk about prophecy, you got to talk about Ananias and Sapphira, who come to church one day saying, here is our gift to the Lord, we give all that we have, and Peter immediately from God by the Holy Spirit discerned the lie in their hearts and calls down the wrath of God so that they both fall down dead on the spot. Now I'm not like the biggest fan of this reality. It's terrifying. <laughs> and in some senses would appear evil to my sinful flesh, which doesn't want judgment on itself. And so it's like, how could God do that? Well, the answer is because they were evil and deserved it. But you know, it's, it's a terrifying reality. So anyway, because the apostles demonstrated this ability to be prophets, the church has always received their written word as prophecy, as words taught by God, demanding our acceptance and belief. Because we are so certain as church that these words are taught by God, all other claims to words taught by God are thus tested by these words. That would be the sola scriptura 
a principle I talked about earlier. But just because something that comes now might at times agree with what scripture says is by no means a final guarantee that it is a new utterance of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Satan is quite capable of saying nice things about Jesus when it suits his motive. Father, we thank you today for your amazing grace for your unending love. I mean, read the temptation account. Moreover, passages like 1 Kings 13, 11 through 22 demonstrate that a Christian, a believer, can, in well-meaning intention, actually do the wrong thing and go against God's word. Our Lord even said clearly in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, that on the last day, he will send off into eternal judgment individuals who believed firmly they were doing his will by the very act of prophesying. Zoinks. More than this, even the owning of the ability to prophesy doesn't even necessarily indicate one state of grace. Take Balaam, the son of Baor, a corrupt man who nonetheless God used as an instrument to immediately reveal words. The apostate apostle Judas also had the ability to heal and cast out demons. The wicked Caiaphas prophesied by the Holy Spirit that it was good for one man to be delivered over to die for the people. In any case, the Old Testament church had the implicit claim from God that any prophet who both provided the proper miraculous signs to accompany his prophecy and did not preach apostasy to the true religion revealed in the Torah, the written word of God, would be a trustworthy prophet. And so the prophet par excellence, Jesus himself, does these very things. But one question we have to answer is, does what was promised to the Old Testament church also apply to the new? And this gets into bigger issues like law and gospel and, you know, circumcision. But you gotta be aware that it is the contention of many charismatics to lay their claims to these gifts based on Old Testament texts. But I think it would be far better to answer the question of whether or not these signs are viable proofs of God's utterances on the basis of New Testament scripture, yeah? And certainly not of just the experience that they claim to be having in the present. So while signs in the Old Testament can be a means of authenticating God's speaking, it doesn't necessarily follow that the same is true for us today. Especially when Christ our Lord warned against such misguided looking for proof when he said in his Olivet Discourse, false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, Matthew 24. And Paul says in 2 Thessalonians that the coming of the lawless one will be accompanied with all power and with false signs and wonders. John the Apostle wrote of the second beast in Revelation, it works great signs. So far from constituting New Testament prophets during the time of tribulation in which we are waiting for our Lord's return, supernatural signs are actually given as a New Testament spotlight upon those who very well may be deviating from the faith. <gasps> <gasps> but wait! There's more! If you want more, I really do recommend you get a hold of this book. You can get it, not usually on Amazon.com, though that is where I found mine, but by calling the Concordia Seminary Fort Wayne, Indiana bookstore and asking for a printed copy. It won't be as pretty as this one, but it'll get the job done. It's full of really clear thinking and biblical text that you just kind of need to go and meditate on. I mean, not just glance at it, but like go read it and think deeply about what it's saying. Look, hey, it says this here. For example, one of my most favorite things from from it is its connection of the prophecy in Acts chapter 2 quoted from Joel about the spirit being poured out in the last day. For example, this little gem that starts with Deuteronomy 28:49, which enunciates a general principle set forth at the end of the Torah that we could call the covenantal curses. That is the things that God is going to do to show that his covenant with Israel has ended because they failed to keep their end of the covenant because their covenant was not a suzerainty covenant one way but a going both ways covenant. And in the day that they rejected him, he would reject them. This curse was as follows. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language, that'd be tongue, you do not understand. Now, unfortunately, this happened. But before it did, God warned of this threat one more time. And so Isaiah rebukes Israel's drunken leaders for disbelieving and rejecting God's word, which had told them to pay tribute to Assyria and not go make alliances with Egypt, which they did anyway. In Isaiah 28, 7, 8, this is where that happened. And then verses 9 and 10 show how they scoffed and belittled Isaiah's saying, don't do it. Isaiah was then giving the mournful duty of giving notice to the covenant curse. And he does so like this. Nay, but by men of strange lips and with an alien tongue will the Lord speak to this people. Which is to say, because the people of Israel were not listening to the prophet who was actually prophesying in a language that was clear for anybody listening to understand, but were 
subjecting the plain words God brought down upon her alien tongues as a sign of punishment. Now you might think this is just a random cherry pick quote, but that's just the thing. In the Old Testament, alien tongues are a sign of punishment. At a later time, Jeremiah picks up on this after the North Country has been taken away when he's preaching to the South Country about the same problem about to happen to them with Babylon. He says in chapter 5 verse 15, Behold, I am bringing against you a nation from afar, an enduring nation, an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. Again, the underlying premise is that it is a covenant curse upon those who reject the clear word of God to give them words that make no sense to them. So when on the day of Pentecost, Israel has the miraculous happenstance of the end of the old covenant with the replacement with the new, spoken in words from all over the world that they did not understand and yet by the Spirit did understand in that moment as pointing to Jesus on the cross, it shouldn't surprise us. But get it, it shouldn't surprise us because at once God is creating the Christian church and demonstrating his final alienation from the Jewish people as a religion, yeah, not as a race. And go figure, this is the point that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 14, when he quotes about tongues, Isaiah, that same text. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and the lips of foreigners, will I speak to this people and even then they will not listen to me. Now if you're gonna let the context of the Old Testament text in any way influence the New Testament quoting of that text, then you have to understand that tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. They are a Sign that God is no longer going to speak to them. And that's actually the next thing that Paul says. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers but for believers. Which is to say the prophecy that is preached by the apostles, which are clear words about Jesus, who he is, what he's done, how he's coming again to save us, his blood atonement, the word and sacraments, baptism, Lord's Supper, all that stuff, that's the sign for believers. For unbelievers, God is going to give them ecstatic, miraculous tongues that aren't actually from him at all. He's simply going to confuse them as a sign of judgment. And so even the miraculous gift given to Christians in the apostolic age as they preached publicly in unlearned tongues was a sign of the end of the old covenant for the Jewish religion, as it were. The tongues are a judicial sign, a judgmental sign, comparable to when Christ himself says, I speak in parables that the meaning might be veiled from them, lest they turn and believe. Now this never stopped the apostles from fervently exhorting people of the Jewish race to turn and believe. As you see in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, many did. But God is now saving them individually by calling them out of the crooked generation and into words they do understand. Because even though the tongues were miraculously spoken in foreign languages, the people who heard them heard Heard them in their native language, not by words of strange lips. So at once God was rejecting the old covenant and instituting the new. Now Acts chapter 10 45 can actually be used to show that this is an even firmer rejection and that now the Gentiles are speaking of Jesus in tongues that the Jews can't understand. And this seemed to be at times a gift that was bestowed by the Holy Spirit through the apostles' hands. All of this is of course stamped when the temple is raised in 70 AD. But don't miss the point. Speaking in unlearned tongues as prophecy immediately given by God as his utterances and real words, the meaning of which must be received and believed and obeyed with no exception in the apostolic period was a temporary sign of something else that was imminent, that was coming, that was there. A signal of God's alienation from the old covenant of Israel and thus something that we shouldn't be surprised to see pass away when the old covenant temple perishes in fire, which happened. So if we're going to let scripture define what the purpose of tongues is, then there remains no reason scripturally for them to still exist. And that's just, you know, a hat tip to a gem. That's not even the whole point of the book. So from the explicit testimony of Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, which sadly we won't have time for here today, to the explicit prophecy of Daniel, when he says the vision will be sealed up in chapter 9, 24, which references the end of the old covenant as the desolation that coincides with the sealing up of the vision and the prophet. He's got a nice treatment of the exegesis Jesus of that text, I have never seen his like, both in careful attention and patience with the word of God as opposed to running amok with what we'd rather think. Ain't nobody got time for that. You have the implicit testimony of Zechariah as well when he says in chapter 13 that I shall remove out of the land the prophets and it will come to pass that if anyone prophesies again, his father and mother will say you shall not live for you have spoken deceit in the name of the Lord and it shall come on that pass that every prophet shall be ashamed of his vision and he will say I am no prophet. To the conclusion 
conclusion that the repeated testimony of Holy Scripture is that the Lord Jesus no longer bestows all the gifts that he once bestowed on his church, but instead has left us the record of his prophecy and utterance from God unmistakably true, all of which testifies not to our own personal power or glory in the present, but the cross of Jesus as the atonement for our sins, the justification of our life in God, and his return to bring all of that to completion on the last day by sight and not just by faith that believes these words. Kind of like it says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1, yeah? In many and various ways God spoke to his people of old by the prophets, but now in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. And of course then you also have the testimony of the church fathers regarding this, which basically kind of says the same thing. You know, like when Chrysostom says, of the gifts going on in Corinth in 1 Corinthians, the whole thing is very obscure, but this obscurity is produced by our ignorance and by their cessation that they stopped. Of course, the Montanists laid claim to all sorts of spiritual and miraculous gift, but it's pretty hard to claim that they were even Christians, much less true prophets. So to answer the question directly, are we today to be trying to make prophecies? The answer is no. You have prophecy revealed to you in Holy Scripture. It's plain language. What more could you want? In fact, we have every reason to rejoice in our Lord's withdrawal of the prophetic gifts because their cessation proves what Jesus said on the cross. It's finished. It's accomplished. There's nothing more to do but believe and wait for our Lord's return. Now, of course, baptize and teach, yeah, but the revelation is done and the day is drawing near. Hope that helps a little bit. I cannot recommend it enough. A patient study. And don't you just buy it so you can scratch it up and not read the texts. Read the texts. You got no good reason as a Bible-believing Christian to expect anything from God but what he's already clearly revealed. And if you reject that, well, yeah. Woe to you, yeah? Take the clear word, not the obscure. In Jesus' name, always rocking on. Remember, if you like what we do here at Warrior Everlasting, you can always support the show with $5 a month to join the Lutheran clan, get connected to Project Awesome, like this video, share it on your wall, on your feed, yada, yada, yada. I already said rock on, so I'm not saying rock on again, except for I know that one of you is going to complain if I do so for your sake. <sighs> rock on. Rock. Rock on. Rock on. Rock on. Rock on. And no, that wasn't speaking in tongues. <laughs> Hup, 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 hup,